Mike Landerly, welcome to Behind the Fiction. Hi, Stephen. How are you doing? I welcome am well. Friend. You're welcome laughing friend. already because you know what this, this episode is for. This is a, um, a fan's Q&A session, and there are some really good questions in here. And everybody who left a question, this is pretty cool, is, has the opportunity to be named as a character in the next book. Well, not in the next book, but in Opus X3, which yes. is uh, in the production stage now. So one of the questions relates to that, but uh, you know that's that's what these the, the the people who gave us the questions are uh, we're encouraged to ask ask questions with that as a prize, and and then we have to decide maybe depending on the question the person asks when they are named the winner, do you kill them right away in a in a horrible way, or do they uh, do they stay on? Just depends, depends on the on quality of the question. <laughs> <laughs> not necessarily the quality. The quality could be fantastic. It, it more has to do whether or not they tripped me up too bad. Oh, if they yes. tripped me up, I'm sorry, but it's going to be a horrible death. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, let's get, let's get the show on the road. First question is from Keith Landry. He wants to know, this is going to trip you up maybe, what kind of mileage does the car get, the car being to Santa? Uh, technically, I believe that it, it's uh, powered with nuclear type or something very similar. So they have what they're called anti-gravitic devices that empower the car to fly. So uh, we have yet to cause them to go into any sort of gas station to help recharge these things. So I'm going to go really, really far. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, Kurt Spa wants to know if the car changes colors or is it available in black? So I think it's, it's like a two-part question. Okay, it, you can have it be black, but uh, our main character, Eric, does get the capability to have it do any sort of colors, which he, of course, uses it for camouflage at times. If he happens to be in, in this lower area, then that probably means dirty, sooty gray as the color. But yes, it does change colors. Now, is that a, an upgrade? I, I, I didn't see that. Well, I didn't look that closely through the brochure. And in, in case... Uh, People listening don't know there actually is a brochure for the yes. for the car, and we'll make it available online, and I'll link to it in the show notes. Um, but there are a, a list of features there that we'll be getting into over the course of the next couple of weeks. Do you happen to remember, Michael? Is the color changing <laughs> thing an option? I'm trying to remember myself because I remember the scene going through it, um, talking about the different upgrades. But the thing is, uh, Eric buys it's it's. Uh, think of it like a, a Mercedes Benz, if you will. Once you get a Mercedes Benz, there's a certain amount of things that are in the Mercedes Benz, which are already there. But for other cars, they're upgrades. So I'm having a really hard time remembering whether or not the colors <laughs> were the upgrade or not. <laughs> okay, gotcha. All right, this is, a, this is an interesting question. This is from Diane Smith. Is it Opus 10 or Opus X, and what does it mean? All right, so uh, great question, by the way. Uh, I would like to vote this one in, into. <laughs> <laughs> but so a little bit of background about myself. I've helped a lot of authors and a lot of those authors have what I call passion projects. When they come and I'm talking to them, you can see that they're incredibly passionate about a particular story. Not necessarily that the story that they have is very commercial. It's just something that they've that they've been thinking about. So oftentimes I'll encourage them. It's like, hey, let's, you know, you need to do this passion project. You need to either find out if it's viable or if it's not viable, and then you can work on whatever's next. So when it came time, I wanted to do something, my own version of a passion project. And because of LMBPN, because of the success the fans have provided us, I was able to put aside a significant amount of money to do the graphics for this project. And so the, the term opus, which my wife Judith was a part of creating, is Michael Landerly's opus, if you will, right? It was, the, it was a nod to my passion project to pull this together with so many people that are part of, of making it happen. And then X is, is not quite 10, it really is, it's kind of like the, op the opus, opus king, opus rex, opus X. Okay, good. Uh, Jeff Eaton and a couple other people ask a similar question. Jeff Eaton asks, do you envision this becoming an expanded universe with multiple storylines? You do have a history with that. 
<laughs> well, okay. I would like to say the fans are to blame <laughs> <laughs> for the Kirthir, the first one, the Kirthirian Gambit. And of course, once we did in Kirthirian Gambit, it happened in Orison and everything else. But, you know, the fans are to blame on that one. If the fans want it, then we pretty much always try to figure out a way to make it occur. Okay. This is, this is maybe a question that could trick you up a little bit because it's a multi-parter. This is from Tom Dickerson. What kind of background can you give us on the key players, the girl, the guy, the AI car, mm -hmm. and uh, maybe even explain the, the difference between the car and the AI? Mm -hmm. And that, that was the second. Yeah, question. that's, that's, well, okay. it's, it's, you know, explain all of those things. So it's a lengthy question for Tom. It may be a long death for, for Tom if he, uh, <laughs> if, he, if he wins. Yeah. <laughs> a very long, painful death. <laughs> it's, it's like no one's getting out of this one alive. I don't <laughs> so in the Foundation series by Isaac Asimov, there's a concept that says that, that um, society, if you will, the different sides of a particular group is not – the west side and the east side. It's actually what's in the center and then what's actually on the frontier. Those are the two most diametrically opposed locations. So when I took this concept, I, I liked that concept. I liked that idea as you have a diaspora of human beings and they go out to multiple planets, you're always going to have a frontier. And so Eric, which is our, uh, our main male character, is he's over 50 years old. He's in what's effectively the army. Um, they're stationed out on the frontier and they're there to protect against a supposed alien invasion. And we already have two or three different alien groups that humanity has interacted with. Very little, but they have. So they're out there. Now, Gia is here on Earth itself. And so Earth, um, in California, there uh, terrorists in the future detonate a bomb and they basically flood Southern California. So it wasn't an earthquake that took it out. It was a terrorist attack. And there are some aspects of it for the rebuilding of that area that it becomes an independent area. It's both part of the United States and yet not part of the United States anymore. And so she's from that advanced locale. You know, you think about it as, as the seat of um, whether it be science or literature or just society. Earth would be it because <clears throat> we're where we started, right? And then, so you have these, <clears throat> excuse me, these two diametrically opposed individuals. Gia is from here. Eric is in the future. Gia comes from a very business-oriented family. He's very military. She's in her, her mid-20s. He's 50 plus, but he takes a de-aging because he needs to track down a particular situation as he comes back to Earth. So that's those two characters. When he gets, when Eric gets here, he believes that he needs to give credence to the fact that he's kind of uh, here to um, blend in, if you will. And based on his de-aging, he feels that he should buy a hot car because with hot cars, you can get other hot cars. And so, <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> During one of the pieces in the first book, they come upon a very radical R&D military AI who shouldn't be where it is. And that is the, about as much as I want to give away as to the three pieces or the four pieces, if you will, of the components. Okay. And the car. Um, he, that, Tom referred to it as the AI car. Are the car and the AI separate They're or is technically, that... technically? They're technically separate, but Emma, which is the AI in this case, Emma wants a body. That's all I'm going to say. Okay. All right. Gotcha. All right. Stephen Blanchard, um, do you hope to create a universe here the size of TKG? You've sort of answered that already. The second question is, how long after the ebook is released will the audio version be available? This is this is a question that if he if he wins, yes, he gets to live forever. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you will be happy to know, even though this is a wide uh, release, and we'll probably have to get into that a little bit later. That the ebook, the audiobook, and the paperback are releasing simultaneously, same day, because Dreamscape has procured the license to the IP, and they are already. Uh, 
are they doing book one, two? Well, well they're, they're, one. they're midway through book one now. Okay. Yeah, and Steve, by the way, if you no one knew, Steve is actually the VP of operations and audio for our company. So if you would like to know anything audio related, his email address is <laughs> Thank you for bleeping that out. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, we're very excited to have partnered with Dreamscape for this. Um, and they're, they'll be doing all 12 books and all 12 of them. Uh, the, the audio book will be released at the same time, which is fantastic. One story. Go ahead. Parts, 18 months. Yes, yes. Uh, Kathleen Nelson Snowberger. I want to know if the car has a personality. Yes, well, sort of. It does now. <laughs> but see, see previous answer. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So you, you don't want to give away too much, but there is, uh, there is personality there. All right, Kurt Spa with another question. I find it interesting that you have been able to find success in so many different worlds and characters. In this, your latest creation, is it getting harder for you to come up with new plots, characters, etc.? That's a great, great question, Kurt. It is a good question. You might live. Um, <laughs> yes, actually, it is. I'm having to, in fact, LMBPN just signed yesterday uh, a, another group of individuals to help us create more content, more IP. And that was um, Yuda. It, don't ask me to pronounce it. <laughs> it's, it's like eight names. Yes. It, there's no, I'm not going to use the word literally, but it is that word, eight names long. And they're all long themselves, multisyllabic. So with Yuda, Ronnie, Navin, which is R.R. Birdie, or R.R. Ronnie Birdie, R.R. Birdie, you can find his books under, and then Navin, and another long name, are an incredibly intense group of guys. And uh, Ronnie and, and Yuda are working with uh, LMBPN related to their messenger universe, which is, think of it, uh, man, it would be hard to describe it more so than there is, it's uh, robots, metal robots uh, attacking Earth with a lot of, um, well, or supporting Earth, and a lot of mysticism that's also a part of it that's, you know, more from the Asianic area of Earth. So I do find it more difficult, but one of the things that I find interesting is that not all of the characters I find fascinating resonate with all of my fans. So one of the challenges I had last year was how in the world do you follow up necessarily a Bethany Ann? Right. So Bethany and your first character is almost like a, um, a band that comes out with the first album and that first album goes multi-platinum. And how do you follow that up? And the answer is I hadn't yet. And so I set out at the end of last year on a trip to Australia to see whether or not I could recapture what I felt were the emotions of Bethany Ann. Because I, I followed up and I went into a different area with, say, the Damned series, Katie and Pandora. And then certainly the uh, Unbelievable Mist Brownstone, which is my most, my second most popular character. And I think that for the most part, which of the Federation, Stephanie Morgana, does capture the emotions uh, of a lot of the readers for what's going on there. So I am having trouble. I do find at times that I have to either go buy a box of comic books because I, I can't read, you know, I can't watch. 50 movies in order to get, you know, to, to refill as Stephen King once said, you know, you need to refill that creative well. And I don't watch TV that much, uh, excluding. <laughs> oh, okay. Maybe you're going to die now. Um, <laughs> it's, well, you start, start answering these things and you realize, oh, I'm going to sound like I'm a tinfoil hat guy. <laughs> but I do like all of the Area 51, the unclassified documents, all of these alien, um, ancient alien things. Even if my, you know, my logical part of my brain is like, that's not really physically possible. And then my creative side goes, but we could make it work this way. <laughs> and so I will really enjoy watching those. But having said that, I've done a lot of comic book purchases in order to be able to go through stories really quickly with graphics that might, you know, cause me to think twice. And you've also mentioned in, uh, in author notes the ah. des desire to get more involved with video games just as a way of stimulating your, your mind with new ideas. I have. And it's interesting. Ah. So I have, I have this. Oh, you totally should have worn this for the interview. 
<laughs> and for people listening be- to the podcast, can you describe it? Yeah, okay, so this is an Oculus Quest. It's, um, it's the, the 64 gigabyte model, which is a standalone VR headset with its own computer built in, right? And it's got two little dangling things off of here, like eight inches, which are the headphones, which I bought. And on the back, you totally, I'm, I've rigged this thing out, right? And on the back is a power brick. So that allows me to plug through the wire and I can keep this going instead of like two hours, I can now go four to six hours without having to plug it in. Um, so I'm playing with this, and even though the graphics, you know, kind of harken back to the Nintendo 64 age, um, because it totally surrounds your eyes and you can see nothing but what's in there, I do get transported into another area. And so I'm finding it fascinating, and they have some relatively low-level uh, um, 360-degree panoramic videos of, like, underwater and so I can be underwater looking at all of the fish and the turtles that swimming by. And, it, you know, it's really odd because one of the experience I had was I was on a, some sort of turtle shelf, if you will, some sort of reef. And I'm staring at this turtle that's just, you know, it's probably three feet tall. And it's just sitting there with its little paddles. And I happen to think, ah, I wonder what's going on around me. And I turn, so you physically turn around, right? Your head has to turn. And another turtle is like right in my face. <laughs> and I'm like, blah, as he, you know, swims by. <laughs> and then he goes, and I'm like, what was the thought that, cre- that it formed in my brain was if I hadn't turned around, all I would have seen is a turtle come over my shoulder and then, you know, basically rested next to the other one. But only because I turned around and was looking, did I see that moment in time? as it came in. And I just particularly find those concepts really uh, interesting. And I'm curious, when you saw that in this virtual world that you were encased in or enclosed in, does it, was it jarring? Did it scare you? Did your, did your heart rate increase or did you know, like, uh, I'm in a game? Um, well, it's, it's more uh, like VHS level video. <laughs> than okay. it is. You know, this particular piece was uh, just video. I'm just staring, you know, around what's going on in, around me. And it, I do remember thinking one time, it's like, I'm not feeling like I have to breathe in like I'm underwater, which I have a fear of death, of drowning. Yeah, I realized I would die clean if I were to die by drowning, but yeah, I do have that fear. And so uh, I, I was amazed to find out I didn't, that didn't bother me. Now, there are a few games that are uh, scary and the intense, but I haven't encountered any of them yet that that really makes me take off, you know, my my uh, VR helmet, the headset. Yeah, yeah, the headset itself. Okay, uh, Tracy Burns says you've mentioned in the behind the fiction videos that there's a good size arc already planned and in the various stages of development for Opus X. Assuming that this series takes off the way others have. Do you have any future concepts or ideas for it? Just sort of simmering in the background. I do now. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's interesting because I'm, I'm focused on these 12 stories, right? And the arcs and everything that has to be done because, as I mentioned before, as a passion project, you know, we, we've been working on this for a year and a half, but we've mostly been working on the graphics side of things. I kind of understood what the story was. And since I had been a part of so many stories, that part doesn't thrill me. It's like, that's not, I don't worry about it, I guess is what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. And so I like the story. I know what it's going to do. I know what that path is like, but I've never hired high quality New York models. I've never been a part of an experience where we um, got seven boxes, large boxes of Hollywood props from movies brought in in order to have to go down them and figure out okay that's the gun yeah that's the outfit and and for some of those i don't like it i found out (laughs) (laughs) i I, it's like i just want them to look really cool well what's the really cool look oh well now i have to still look through the thing damn it (laughs) (laughs) you know so i realize through this experience how inside of a movie you would need someone who needs to do clothes you know needs to do guns because they would understand what all that stuff is but as the single point of um, creativity on this it's overwhelming so i'm really happy that a big chunk of this has been passed in the background and 
so that's where my focus has been. These 12 books. Now that the fans are asking me about the rest of it, I'm like, hmm. Mm-hmm. Got the brain working again. Yeah. In, in, back in story, back in storyland. Okay. Kathleen Fettig, I believe. I apologize mm-hmm. if I butchered your name. In what way, and, and I'm asking you this question. There are, there are a couple different ways to go with the answer, so we'll try and explore both of them. But she asks, in what ways does this new series differ from all your others? The easy answer is this is a wide series and all that entails, but from mm-hmm. a storyline um, prospect or Romance. perspective. Romance? Romance? Okay. Yeah, I, I won't be killing a person in book nine, <laughs> this thing. <laughs> Why? Have you done that before? <laughs> I, I might hey. have. <laughs> I might have thought, you know what? I don't want to get a romance in the middle of my space opera. I'll just kill him off. <laughs> Bad idea. <laughs> but well, no, it really gave you the um, opportunity to write four additional books. <laughs> and by opportunity, you mean, yes. So... <laughs> A couple of things that are that are relevant to this. We have been traveling around the world multiple times with LMVP into the different book fairs, and it's become evident. And, and America is kind of a melting pot anyway, but it's you know evident that not everybody is exactly like me. But my first main character was a white woman. My first or my second, my personal second main character is a white guy. Right? It's what I'm familiar with. So Gia is not a white person and that was by design you know i wanted something a little different i do um i like a lot of the pieces that i see in china and i think it's similar to like mexico a lot of people know that i'm building a house in cabo san lucas mexico and the only thing that or the first thing people always go is what about all of the killings down there and i'm like if if they would actually pay attention they would find out that it is safer in cabo san lucas mexico than it is on the streets of los angeles or some of the other major cities in the united states because the news skew it up so bad and so when we went to to unfortunately this is totally accurate the first time that i went to china i feared for my life not from the standpoint of getting hurt but because i didn't think i could eat anything <laughs> I remember that. <laughs> <laughs> a little a little side note is I like meat, I like <laughs> potatoes, and I like other things that are carb. I don't like vegetables at all. None of them. Well, okay, maybe some refried beans. But anyway, well, those are carbs too. I digress. So I'm going to Mexico or to, to China and I'm talking to Haley Lawson, one of our other collaborators who goes there for work. And she's like, I carry boxes of these protein bars. And I'm just, I'm just, the horrible thought is going through my mind of what I'm going to have to do. And we get to China and we're staying at a hotel that's walking distance to the Beijing book fair uh, in Beijing, interestingly enough. And um, there's a pizza hut like 150 <laughs> yards away. And I'm like, oh, thank goodness, I'm going to survive. And so we go to the Pizza Hut, and we realize, thankfully, there's other restaurants, too. (laughs) That particular Pizza Hut, not the best, but it allowed me. So this year, we go a second time. We're a little bit more prepared. I'm not worried about the food. And I guess I see all of this to say I've been up and down neighborhoods. I've been to the Great Wall. The people in China are fantastic. You know, they are, it's like, except for the fact that I can't speak their language, they're very gracious, they're very uh, nice for the most part, and I'm sure there are places in China that are similar to our Los Angeles, which is, can't now, not all of Los Angeles, but specific parts, can be very rough. But I haven't been to those. I've just been to the other, you know, general areas, and it's, it's, I enjoyed it. So, Chia is coming from a Chinese-American descent. All right. So, and, and before we go on to the next question, I want to share a quick Michael Anderley dining oh. story. We were at your favorite restaurant, your favorite Mexican restaurant in the area, I think. Javier's? Javier's. Javier's. Yes, so I'm, I'm pointing, well, no, uh, uh, it's back over here, about 250 yards that way. Yes, yes. You can, if you squint, you can see it through his wall there. <laughs> <laughs> you better squint like Superman. <laughs> so we're, we're there with a group of people one day, and the server comes by to take her order. Everybody orders something kind of normal. Michael also orders something kind of normal, but the way he orders it is different. He says, I'll have the beef fajitas, and I don't want any of those vegetables. And so the waiter looks at him for a minute and says, so just the beef in the pan? He's like, yes, <laughs> but I do want the 
the uh, the tortilla. You you wanted yeah, the tortilla so, as so, well, but yeah. that was so that was it. Like fried beef in a pan. No, <laughs> no, it's beef fajitas without the veggies. So I get the beef fajitas right, and the, and they're they marinated, so it's not like they have no flavor. <laughs> Mr. Campbell. And then I, I, and then I say, no, not the corn. I'd like the flour. And then I would take the refried beans and, and I'd like some cheese, not the guacamole. <laughs> <laughs> but I'd never seen it. Just, just so like this now, pan Bert. of fried meat just shows up and I'm like, wow, I'm really glad I got the tacos. <laughs> <laughs> and they were excellent, by the way. They are excellent. Except right. for, well, I was going to say one. You, you're not going to put me in the book and kill me now because I told this story. Are you? I had never considered doing that, son of a But now, <laughs> <laughs> book four. <laughs> All right. Speaking horrible. of real life, Larry Omens asked, do you use real life friends, family, et cetera, as a basis for your characters? And if so, how does it make you feel when you have to kill them in the story? We may find out in a couple of books. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I haven't done it as I've done uh, fans, uh, you know, Kirthier and Gambit in the first few books. Um, we put quite a few fans into it. In fact, all of the people that come up and were fans and some of those fans have gone on to write their own books as well. So that's really gratifying. I'm trying to think of whether or not I've done like family. I don't know that I'm, it, I would think I have now. Okay. Here's a, one of those true confessions that, that this question brings up. My older brother's name is Daryl. And we, of course, have a Daryl in Kirthier and Gambit. My brother spells his name D-A-R-R-Y-L. And I didn't want to mimic my brother's spelling. Talking about an asinine thing to do, but this was <laughs> asinine. And so I, I changed his spelling to D-A-R-R-E-L or something like that, thinking that I would not regress to how I've spelled Daryl my whole <laughs> effing life. And so I don't know that we've ever figured out all the correct spellings for Daryl is now there because I kept changing and people were like, why does his name keep changing? And I'm like, I cannot believe it. <laughs> so that, that is definitely one slight family. And Craig Martell, I, I killed him, I think. <laughs> but he deserved it. He made me this horrible, ma this horrible mayor of a city that was doing crappy things and he's like yep that's Anderley. i'm like you are a 10 foot jerk 